Let's start with prayer again. God, we're so thankful for you. We stand in awe of your love and your power. Mm-hmm. And we confess that many times we misunderstand who your son is and we have our own preconceived notions about who we want him to be and we try to mold him and shape him uh, into uh, the image that we want. 
that we pray that you would help us to see the image that you've presented to us through your word. Help us to see as uh, we continue looking at the gospel of Mark how um, how Jesus calls us to authentic discipleship. Amen. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, soften our hearts, help us to be more receptive to your will in our lives, yes. and help us to have a clearer picture of what it is that you've called us to yes. and who you've called us to be. We're so thankful that you love us and you care for us, and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Right. So how many were not here the first time? Okay, there's a few of them. Uh, this is going to be uh, about a three-minute uh, cap of what we did, all right? So if you're writing, you better write fast. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Here, here is the issue that we face. It's the issue with the images that we see all around us. Uh, you know, our our uh, media today puts before us all kinds of images that uh, oftentimes leave us confused and we're struggling to figure out exactly what's going on. I mentioned the first in the first session about the uh, the new Apple commercial where all of the people start running out of what seems to be like some kind of old abandoned warehouse or prison and they're all in these colored jumpsuits. Yes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And for, for most of the commercial, you have no idea what's going on and why they're doing this. The song's playing. At the very end, they tell us it's about color. Yeah. You know, and look at this new product that we have. That's what they're, they're selling. And so these images oftentimes leave us confused, and images of Jesus confuse us as well. And so you think about all of the paintings that we see of Jesus, how he has this perfect skin, he's groomed, you know, and uh, he's, his, his eyebrows are scaped, so they're perfect, you know. And I mean, he's, he's just this uh, fine-looking man. And that's the image that uh, all of our paintings, all of our images portray him as. And I'm not saying that he wasn't. I'm not saying that his skin wasn't perfect. I mean, it very, very well may have been. But I'm guessing it probably wasn't. Right. I'm guessing he was like everybody else. Yep. And the issue comes when we begin looking at him and trying to mold him and shape him and picture him the way that we want him to be rather than the way he is. And so what we're looking at in this class uh, in the last hour and then in this one, is noticing the way Mark helps us see the true Jesus. And he does so in a way that seems very confusing to us at times because we look at it and we say, Man, how did all these people who saw him do all of these wonderful things, how is it that they can find themselves in chapter 4 in this boat where the storm is coming and Jesus is over there asleep and they're upset at him because he's sleeping, and they wake him up and say, don't you care? Hmm. And then we're told that they are, after Jesus calms the storm, that they are wondering and thinking to themselves, who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obeyed him? Yeah, that's right. Who is he? They've been following him. They've seen him, uh, they've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him uh, heal a paralytic. They, they've seen him heal a man with a withered hand. They've seen all of these wonderful things that he is able to do they've listened to him teach and notice how amazing he is as a teacher and so much so that it, they, the statements made uh, that he teaches as one who had authority not like the scribes not like these expert teachers he teaches better so something's different about him and that's what mark is helping the reader to understand and we made our way into uh, chapter 8 uh, in the beginning portion of this chapter, we see the feeding of the 4,000. We've already witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. And we closed our last session with verse 14 and following. And this section is showing the misunderstanding of the disciples of Jesus. And so it comes to this, there we go, it comes to this climax in chapter 8, verse 21, where they've forgotten to bring bread. They only have one loaf with them in the boat. And they're concerned that Jesus is going to be upset. Not only that, the words of Jesus, which are geared toward the spiritual realm about not listening or following the leaven uh, of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. You've got to pay attention to this, is what he's saying to, to them. They're thinking, because he mentioned the word leaven, that he's talking about bread. And so they start thinking within themselves that uh, he, he's about to get on to us because we didn't bring enough bread. That's when he addresses the issue of their misunderstanding. He yeah. says... 
Think about when we fed the 5,000 plus, because we're told elsewhere in Scripture that it was more than that. The number of men were 5,000 besides women and children. So he fed that great multitude. In this chapter, we see him feeding another great multitude. They've all witnessed this. And Jesus says, how is it that you still don't understand? You've got eyes to see, but you don't perceive. Ears to hear, but you don't hear. You don't understand. How is it that you still don't understand? That's where we're at. This, verse 21, is the transition in Mark's gospel. Chapter 8 is critical to our understanding what Mark is doing with his gospel. Uh, because of this particular section, in verse 21 where he says, Do you not yet understand? That's the dagger that comes into us even. Because there are so many times where we read his word. We see everything that he has done. We're able to understand and read it and know what the words mean. We're able to talk about the stories and the events, the encounters that Jesus had. And we reach this point where there are times that we misunderstand completely. Not misunderstand the text. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is we misunderstand who he is. And the way that that is evidenced is by our actions by our language. We talk about praying for those that we love, that are hurting, that are going through some kind of tragedy. We pray for them and we're begging God to heal them. How many times in our prayers to Him, in our minds, are we thinking, it's probably not going to happen? You ever do that? I'm going to pray for it probably not going to happen. That's a misunderstanding of Jesus and his power. And so for us, we've got to realize that this text, Mark's gospel, brings us to this point of how to answer this question. Do I not yet understand? Now, uh, let's, move, let's move forward, but I want you to think about this. This gospel gives me such great hope because it, it shares with me the reality that even those that were closest to Jesus throughout his ministry, they struggled to understand. That gives me great hope. I'm not the only one that struggles. They did too. And I think that's part of why Mark shares with us these events. I want you to look at verse 22. We've got this miracle that seems a little odd. But I want to read it and let's think about what the scripture says. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes, uh, he uh, laid his hands on him, and he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up, and he said, I see people, and they look like trees, walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. This story, this miracle that we see, has a lot of different directions that I've seen uh, people go in talking about this. The question that I have for you is that, did Jesus have to touch this man twice? Because of Jesus' inability to heal? No. Or because of the man's faith? Careful. Hang on, hang on. So hang on now. Are you sure? It's not dependent on his faith. Jesus has the power. Okay, Jesus has the power. But faith is not missing here. And, and most of the miracles that Jesus does, somebody faith, if it's a friend of the friend of the paralytic, faith is mentioned, but it's not mentioned. Not mentioned here. So should that tell us anything? It should. I'm not sure. All right. You can, hey, listen. You, you can understand how, how, we, uh, how we struggle sometimes, right? Because, I mean, what, what are we reading about here? Well, this man's being healed. Jesus touched him twice. Did you know this is the only miracle that Jesus performs where he had to do something twice? And I wonder why that is. And I wonder why Mark puts it right here. Is it because it was just that way in the chronology of events? I don't think so. I think this is here to serve as a bookend for this section. I want you to think about this. Here this man is who uh, he's not asking to be healed. 
But here he comes, and you see, they bring to him. Some other people bring to him this blind man. Okay? Jesus takes him out of the city by the hand, leads him out of the village, and he touches him and asks the question, do you see anything? And what does he see? Go ahead and tell me. We just read it. People walking, people walking, but what? They look like trees. What does that show us? It's not clear. He sees these images, but it's fuzzy. There you go. He wasn't always blind. Okay, he wasn't always blind. How else would he know? Yeah, okay. Fuzzy. Do you see anything? I don't see people walking around. They look like trees. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe the first one didn't take. Let me touch you again. Yeah. Jesus does. And then notice what Mark says. you got to listen to the language that Mark's using here. Jesus touches him again, verse 25. His eyes are opened. His sight is restored. And then what? He saw everything clearly. Okay. Why would he tell us this story right here? What just happened in Mark's gospel? Not necessarily chronologically. What just happened in Mark's gospel? They didn't see very clearly. That's it. They didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. You ever say whenever you're trying to understand something, this may be an Arkansas thing and I get it, but I think Texas is the same <laughs> way. Anyway, oh, I see. Somebody's explaining it to you. Oh, I see. That's the way this word is used. Understand. You see anything? Yeah. You understand? This miracle that's given to us right here is illustrating for us this issue that the disciples have to see clearly. They're not seeing him clearly. They're confused about, well, we only took one loaf of bread, and now we're getting into a boat with Jesus, and he's going to be upset with us because we don't have enough to eat. And Jesus is like, don't you get it? Don't you know who I am? You remember I fed 5,000, I fed 4,000 with this little bit of food. Yeah. How is it that you think that you're going to starve because we only have one loaf, and I'm with you? Don't you think I can feed you? <laughs> They didn't understand. How is it that you don't understand? And we come back to this miracle, and Jesus is showing us, and Mark, through this miracle, is showing us the process of understanding who Jesus is. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It may be that we come to this point, or people may come to this point of, Believing in Jesus and making that confession of faith in Him. Believing in Him. But do they fully understand Him? No. And we don't require people to fully understand Christ in order to receive salvation. If you believe in Him, you believe that He's the Son of God, and you confess your sins and you repent and you're baptized, salvation has come to you. And we believe that fully. It's not about having to know everything or understand everything clearly. But we do struggle with seeing him for who he is. And this story teaches us that. Now, I said this is a first bookend. I want you to flip over. And we're going we're gonna to look at this again in, in a moment. But I want you to flip over real quick and just catch the, the second bookend. It's chapter 10, the very last of the chapter. So from, cha from chapter 8, verse 22, then to chapter 10, the, the end of the chapter, this is a section in the middle of Mark's gospel where he is helping us to see the process of understanding Jesus. And so the end of chapter 10, we see it at, beginning at verse 46, uh, another healing of a blind man. This is Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus hears them coming knows that it's Jesus who's coming and begins crying out. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's, they say, hey, be quiet, leave him alone. You know, he's got work to do. Don't, don't bother him right now. And he cries out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And we're going to come back. I'm going to leave you right there. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But I want you to think about these bookends. Let's go to chapter 9. Well, back up just prior to chapter 9. <laughs> Sorry. I want, to, I want to share this too. <laughs> I didn't have this in my notes, but I think it's important. Look at Peter's confession in verse 27 of chapter 8. It follows this two-part healing. And uh, verse 27, 
uh, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who am I? Who are people saying that I am? They told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? This is the issue. Understanding Jesus and who he is. Seeing him clearly. Peter responds, you are the Christ. Okay? And I think that's important here. We have to go elsewhere to see the reality of what's happening. Uh, in verse 30, he strictly charged them not to tell anyone about him. Doesn't that seem strange? Well, Peter's statement of, of faith and who Jesus was here is just simply given, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. Okay? What does Matthew say about that? Really, Jesus in Matthew's account, chapter 16. Remember Peter? He says, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Remember Jesus says, go ahead, say it. For my Father which is in heaven. Look, you didn't come up with that on your own, Peter. That's what Jesus is saying to it. Look, hey, flesh and blood, you didn't come up with that on your own. God gave that to you. Okay? So that tells me that Peter didn't really understand what he was saying here. But he made this good confession. But Jesus acknowledges that he didn't come up with that on his own. But God let him say that. God gave that to him. Okay? Now, the reason that I say this is because Mark doesn't share that with us, but I do think it's important to this section. Okay? So chapter 9. Are y'all still there? Okay. Beginning at verse 2. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And they appeared to them, uh, there appeared to them Elijah and, with Moses, uh, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they saw no longer anyone with them but Jesus only. Now, this is where Mark helps us to see that Peter didn't really get it. Okay? This is the point at which Peter, who nervously talks, y'all know anybody that talks because they're nervous? They just always talk. You never, we know people like that. If you don't know anybody, then you... Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, you, so... Peter's that guy. Peter is that guy who's going to talk yeah. because he doesn't know what else to do. His right. mouth just starts moving. Yeah. Okay? That's what happens here. This is the point where Mark shows us that Peter doesn't understand about Jesus. Because if he truly understood about Jesus, he would never have said, hey, let's build three tents, one for each of you. Right. Let's make you equal with Moses and Elijah. Yeah. He didn't understand. But he's coming to an understanding. It's this process that he goes through. All right, let's go now to chapter 10. Let's hit that story of Bartimaeus. So, this section again. I'll confess to you that there are times that I may uh, overthink something. And... Lindsay can attest to that. <laughs> My wife, Lindsay, wrote it. Uh, I may overthink it, but I believe there's something going on here in this story. Let's read it. So, uh, verse 46. They, they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus uh, stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man. And they said to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus says to him, 
go your way. Your faith has made you well. Two healings of blindness. One, Mark shows through Jesus' action that there's a lack of understanding on the part of the disciples. The other, this man comes full of faith. When people are trying to shut him up, he cries out louder because he knows who Jesus is. Does that make sense? Okay. You, you see it in the, the lack of discussion of faith in that first healing. You know, I don't think it's an issue of faith. I think it's an issue of us seeing clearly in that first one. The second one is faith. This man believes in who Jesus is. He understands what he can do, and he calls out, even when people are saying, be quiet, don't talk, don't bother him. He cries out all the more. These two stories serve as bookends of this section where we see uh, the disciples going through this process. Chapter 11 begins with the triumphal entry. This is the last, last week of Jesus' life. He's been with his disciples this long, and now they're still struggling to understand. As a matter of fact, you remember what happens in Acts chapter 1? Remember verse 6? There they are gathered together. The statement, Lord, what? Is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Man, he's already died. He's risen again, and he's been with them for some time, and now he's about to ascend back to the Father, and they're still confused. Do you see that? Okay. I hope we're on the same page here. Mark's bringing us to this. Man, he's about to hit us, okay? He's bringing us to this point of uh, coming to this question of, do I really understand who Jesus is? All right. So uh, we make our way through uh, this section, uh, and you see the different events that took place during that last week of Jesus' life, his teachings, uh, the issues with the fig tree as Jesus continues to teach. Make your way to chapter 15. Chapter 15. <clears throat> Jesus has been arrested, gone through that mock trial, has been presented before Pilate. Exchange with Pilate occurs. I want us to look at chapter 15. And I know many of these events will be familiar to you, but I want to call to mind for you uh, a cultural uh, nuance to what we read about here. Uh, and I think Mark is addressing some cultural issues of the day. And I think this is very important for us. Let's, let's catch what is, is happening here. Verse 1. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and they led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. This, and I'm just going to stop there for a moment. This, this statement, this question from Pilate is one that he's heard others talk about. <clears throat> and he's heard this council make these claims about Jesus. This is who he says he is. And clearly, Jesus is, without saying it out loud, is saying it. Yes, he says you've said so. And so verse 3, the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate Again asked him, uh, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. What are you talking about? He defended himself. So let's keep going. Verse 6. Now at the feast, he used to release uh, for them uh, one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison uh, who had committed murder uh, in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. Uh, the crowd came up and they began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Uh, for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him. Uh, but the chief priests stirred up the crowd to him uh, they re to release to them Barabbas. Uh, verse 12, Pilate said again to them, Then what shall I do with this man that you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? Uh, but they shouted all the more, Crucify him. And so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. 
And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The interesting thing is that you've got two individuals that are brought before the people. Who is it that you want me to release? Barabbas, this murderer, or Jesus, this one in whom you can't find any fault? And they're shouting, crucify Jesus, right? It's two guys. You know how names mean something? What's Barabbas' name? Son of the Father. Abba, Father, Daddy. Bar, Son, Son of the Father. You've got these two guys who are sons of the Father. One is a murderer, and one is dying for murderers. And here this set this this is set up by Mark in a specific way, I think, to help us see Jesus better. Here's the rest of it. The interesting thing beginning at verse 16 is that Mark understood uh, cultural dynamics. He understood uh, the history of society. Uh, he understood some of the actions of the, of the government, uh, of the officials. And part of that understanding, I believe, and again, this is my opinion, but I believe part of his understanding comes out in the way that he shares uh, the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And I want us to look at it. Think about the uh, ordination ceremony of a Roman Caesar. Uh, this was something that no doubt Mark had witnessed or at least knew about. Uh, he may very well have been present or seen one of these events take place, but no doubt he knew about it. Uh, think about what would happen. So uh, the, the candidate for Caesar would be selected they would bring him in, and we're going to walk through these steps in Mark's gospel because Mark lays it out for us. Verse 16, the soldiers led him, Jesus, away inside the palace that is the governor's headquarters. So they would bring him, uh, this uh, prospective Caesar, they would bring him into the palace, and there he would be in the, the large room, in the praetorium. And notice the end of verse 16. They called together the whole battalion, the garrison, some of you may have. These were the elite soldiers. These were the ones that were given the task. This would be like our secret service protecting the leader, okay, protecting the president. They, they were good. They were the tough guys. They would, they would guard. So they brought all of them in, and they would, during the ordination ceremony, they would line the praetorium. And here this perspective Caesar would be brought before them. Those are the first two steps. Verse 17, the third step in the ordination ceremony of a Roman Caesar, they would bring a robe and put it on him, and they would put a crown on his head. Okay, verse 17, they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. Okay? The next thing that they would do there in the praetorium is that they would all shout out the word triumphe. Okay, can y'all say that with me? Triumphe. They would keep shouting it. Triumphe. Triumphe. What triumphe meant was show us who you are. Show us your power. Show us what God is like. That's what they're saying to him. And so they would shout this out. You know, show us who you are. And as you know historically, the Roman Caesars... Um, required that the people worship them as God. Yeah. And so we see this scene coming up in verse 18. They began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. It's as if they're yelling, Triumphe, Triumphe. Verse 19. Uh, they were striking his head with reed. They were spitting on him. They were kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his purple cloak, and they put on him his own clothes, and they led him out to crucify him. <clears throat> Certainly they wouldn't beat the prospective Caesar, but they would then take him and lead him out of the praetorium, out through the city, and have a big parade. And people were cheering and, and shouting, and chanting. But the issue with the parade was this, that as they would go on their way, there would be uh, the sacrifice that was going to be offered to this Caesar during this time, during this uh, ordination ceremony. 
and it would go along in this procession. And following behind would be the man that wielded uh, the, the sacrificial weapon to kill and uh, to slay this animal. And he would be walking along. And you use in your mind the image of them leading Jesus out. And you remember he falls beneath the weight of the cross. And they call somebody, come and carry this. And Jesus continues to walk in this procession while his cross is coming behind him with Simon carrying it. And you see the scene just continuing to play out in verse 21. They compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And so Jesus, who is the sacrifice, is, is leading this procession with the instrument of death behind him. <clears throat> Verse 22, they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The, uh, the place that they would take the perspective Caesar was called Capital. It means head hill, the capital, the high peak, head hill is what it literally means. And we have this statement given to us from Mark that they took him to the place of the skull. And again, images of uh, the ordination ceremony coming out. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 23. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. During the ceremony, they would offer to the, the prospective Caesar all of these goods, or you know, whatever to drink, you know, fine wines, and all of this wonderful thing. He would refuse it. Why? Because the Caesar is self-sufficient. He has need of nothing. So he would refuse it. We see Jesus... Mark telling us that Jesus does this very thing as well. The next thing that would happen is they would once again yell, Triumphe, Triumphe, Triumphe. Outside on Head Hill, they're yelling this and, and chanting this. Show us your power. Show us what God is like. Historically, and you can, you can look back and read through uh, some of these events, uh, these pr prospective uh, emperors would devise some kind of way to have a commotion happen at that moment where they're outside and, and something happens that causes people to think, oh, look how powerful he is. Like, for instance, one of them had a flock of doves released at this moment. So you have, you know, like he's controlling this. Yeah. And they would do these things to deceive the people into believing he was powerful. And here we see them again, verse 24 and following. Shouting triumphe, seemingly. Show us who you are. Show us your power. Show us what God is like. They crucified him. They divided his garments among them, casting lots for them. They decided uh, to decide what each should take. Verse 25, it was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription was placed above him, the king of the Jews. Uh, with him were crucified two robbers, one on his right hand, one on his left. Uh, those uh, who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, here's the triumphe part, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Triumphe! Show us who you are! That's what they're saying. So verse 31, So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him uh, to one another, saying, He saved others, he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Triumphe! Show us who you are! Show us your power. Show us what God's like. And I wonder if at any time while Jesus was hanging on the cross, <laughs> he wasn't thinking to himself, I am showing you what God is like. Yeah. Powerful message from Mark sharing us with, with us who Jesus is. It's interesting to me the events that take place just after this, when Jesus dies, we see that the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom. We talked about that earlier, how that means it's ripped so as to not be able to be repaired, never to go back again. The, the veil is torn from top to bottom. Jesus opens the way to God for us through his death. Verse 37, Jesus uttered a loud cry. He breathed his last. And here's the climax. When the temple veil is torn from top to bottom, we see this Roman guard, the centurion, standing at the foot of the cross in verse 39. And he says, truly, this man was the Son of God. Okay, let's remember back. It's been a while, but nine, 
948 this morning, we said, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeah. That's what Mark sets out to do through his gospel over and over. And there's so many other places that we can look at that we just don't have time for. But I encourage you to go and read through Mark's gospel and note those places where he is pointing to who Jesus is. Because no one else in this, in this gospel understands who he is. The demons know, and they're terrified. But nobody else knows until this moment where we see this man standing at the foot of the cross saying, truly this man was the son of God. This statement from him helps us to understand that it's only when we come to the foot of the cross that we can see Jesus for who he truly is. This is him saying, this is what God is like. Love, sacrifice, giving. This is what God is like. And so all of our images of the Messiah, who we think we want him to be, and how skewed they get because of our own biases. Mark says, here's the real Jesus. You need to understand. It's okay if you're struggling right now. Because remember chapter 8, 22 through chapter 10, verse 52. It's a process. The challenge that we face each day is recognizing that our world is saying there's nothing really special about this Jesus guy. Yeah, he was a great teacher. You know, the deity of Jesus is a hotly debated topic. And we see people trying to make claims about who Jesus is, and they, they want to uh, take away his divinity. And Mark says, no, he's God in the flesh. And he's demonstrating to you what God is like. Listen to him. Follow him. David Kinnaman, uh, in his book, Unchurched, he said this, in the eyes of many, the Christian faith has an image problem. Many unchurched persons have been turned off to Christianity, though not necessarily to Jesus. They don't like politicized religion in America, along with what they see as ample Christian arrogance, hypocrisy, judgmentalism, and disconnectedness from the real world. That's what the world around us is looking. My, my point in sharing that with you is this. While we struggle to understand Jesus, everybody else is too. And we've got to admit that. But the only way that they're going to be able to see the real Jesus is if we live him out. If we truly become his hands and his feet. And we show, as Jesus has shown, what God is like. Jesus said, uh, you need to love one another. He says, the reason that I'm calling you to love one another is because everybody else is going to know that you're my disciples. Yeah. But if we're out here, and if we're being arrogant, if we're being judgmental, if we're arguing, if we're fighting with one another, man, what does that say to the world about Jesus? Hmm. My challenge for you is this. Take a look again at the Gospel of Mark. And as you read through, I want you to notice how many times Mark is striving to get the reader to see clearly who Jesus is. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for all that you do. And Father, we confess that there are many times that we put forth an image of, of Jesus that's not the reality. And I pray that you would forgive us of that. Forgive us when we're arrogant. Forgive us when we're hypocritical. Forgive us when we are judgmental. Help us, Father, to live lives that bring honor and glory to you. Yes, sir. And I pray that when we face the challenges that our world is throwing our way, that we would continue to stand firm in our faith in you and in your son. Help us to stand firm in the truth of your word. And help us to never shy away from proclaiming the wonderful news of Jesus and the salvation you've brought to us through him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Hope y'all have a great day.